Hello, sorry that it's been a while since our last episode. This is going to be episode 13. Um, in the near future, I want to work on feel. I think that's one of the biggest things we need to address with our game. Um, but we're not quite ready to do that yet because there's a couple of things outstanding. The main thing is there's, there's a really serious bug uh, with our game that I want to demonstrate and then fix. And then the way we fix that is a really useful uh, line of code that we will be using all over the place. So I want to actually, I don't want to just breeze over it briefly, I want to use it in a different way as well, so you can see why it's useful. Um, and yeah, this is just a planning document of like what I think we might do this episode or what we'll do afterwards. This is probably too much for one episode, but um, yeah, adding some sounds is really going to add a lot to the game, but we're not doing that today. Today, uh, okay, so what is the problem with our game? Let's play it. Uh, we've got the main sort of concept working, which is that... Um, you are it's a stealth game until you are detected and then it becomes a kind of defense you know different waves of incoming enemies kind of game um we actually right now if you don't shoot sorry right now if you if you don't get detected but you do shoot the enemies don't get summoned and they should do so we'll fix that today as well um but what's the big problem the big problem is uh let's see in scene view i want to redesign this level slightly to to illustrate our issue what if, right now we've got these big thick walls, but what if we had a thin wall like this, which is kind of not unusual in a, a game like this. Um, oh, no, I didn't want to change that. <laughs> uh, let's just make this be closer to this guy and over here. Just a guard who's in any way up against a wall that you can potentially be on the other side of. And I stand the other side of it. I get detected. What the hell, man? The wall's blocking you. And because of our lovely like light vision cone, you can even see that the vision cone is completely blocked perfectly by that wall. Uh, and yet I got detected. So that's bad. Um, and we knew this was going to happen, didn't we? I, mean, I mentioned it at the time. Um, because in our guard behavior, I hope that, uh, that this is the right version of the project I have open. Um, here's the bit of code that D does detection. So this is in guard behavior. If they're not already alerted, they rotate uh, when idle, and then they check. Hey, is the player close enough to us for us to see them? Are they within our vision range? And then if so, are they within our vision angle? And then if so, we've seen them. Well, that's a bit hasty, isn't it? Uh, there's another step. It, is there a clear line of sight? Is there anything blocking our line of sight? That's what we want to find out now. And we're going to do that. It's going to be the last check we do, because um, it's going to be done with a ray cast. We've actually used We've sort of used a raycast before um, for when we wanted to know uh, where the player cursor is. In fact, we definitely have used a raycast. Um, we and I remember I described it as like firing a laser out of your eyes <laughs> to find out where the where the camera hits this hits the ground basically, and that tells you where the, where the cursor is in in world terms. Um, now this case is we're going to fire a laser out of the enemy's eyes <laughs> at us, and we want to know does that laser hit any walls? That's the key thing. Um, and this is this is a ray cast. It's because uh, you're casting a ray, um, shooting a laser, and we need a few different things uh, set up to, in order to do it. What a ray cast tells you. So the way we've used it before is a bit of a, a, a special case. The much more common thing is you're usually going if physics physics dot ray cast. And then a whole bunch of stuff in those brackets. What goes in that brackets is incredibly. Um, there's a huge number of different ways of calling the raycast function. In fact, maybe I can show you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So as you start to the, as you open the brackets here, it says, "Okay. Oh, you want to do physical raycast? Yeah, I know about that. You, do you want to pass in a ray? Oh, we could pass in a ray if we had a ray. We don't have a ray. That's that's a variable type we haven't used, and we're not going to use it. Uh, these up and down arrows show the other ways you can call this function." Well, you could call it with a ray and a max distance. You could call it with a ray and an out hit ray cast hit info. You could call it with an origin and direction. You could call it with a ray, max distance, and layer mask. You could call it with a ray, hit info, and max distance. There are 16 of these, <laughs> and they get long, and the order is not something I can remember. Um, we are going to... Uh, we're going to use a lot of these. Uh, so, I said that we're shooting a laser out of the enemy's eyes, so... We know where the enemy is. We know the origin for this ray is. It's going to be the, the enemy's transform dot position. So that's argument one is done. Um, let me see if I can just find the one that we're going to use. Uh, this is it. Okay. 
So uh, you don't need to know that it's 11 out of 16, uh, but this is a convenient way of calling a function because it's all things we know. So where, where is the ray coming from? It's coming from the enemy's position. Where is the ray going? What direction is it going? We don't give it an end point. Um, for some reason, you never, you never do that with raycasts. You do give it a starting point and a direction. Um, and actually, conveniently, we already defined vector to player. We have that. Um, let me just check where it is. Yeah, that was that turned out to be a convenient thing for other things to do with enemy detection and, and um, seeking the player. So we already defined a vector to the player. Vector to the player means what direction do we have to go to reach the player, and it also contains information about how far they are away. Basically, vector to player is the journey we would take to get to the player right now if we went directly. Um, and in the case of a raycast, when you specify a direction, it doesn't matter how big the vector you're passing in is. Um, it's sort of common to pass in a vector that's only length one, but it doesn't matter at all. It could be as long as you like. And uh, since we already have one that's going the exact right direction, we don't care that it's um, that we don't even know how long it is. Uh, because the next argument is where we say how far uh, we the ray should go. Now, um, we just want to go as far as that vector is. Like, however big it is, that's how far we want to go. And there's a way of writing that. It's vector to player dot magnitude. Um, and then this last thing is a layer mask. Um, and that is takes a bit more setup. So that little snap noise, by the way, was a, a timer that I had going. <laughs> it's uh, not anything you need to worry about. Um, the last thing is a layer mask. And we don't have one of those. A layer mask is a way of telling the ray which things you want it to collide with and which things you don't want it to collide with. And we want it to collide with walls, but nothing else. Um, so if we didn't, if we didn't mask the layers, uh, to use uh, Unity's terminology, then this ray would hit everything. So it would always the first thing it would hit is the person firing it. This is an absolutely classic bug that <laughs> almost every game developer will run into at some point. Is you, you have uh, an entity that's supposed to shoot out a projectile of some kind, usually a, a gun or a bullet or whatever, and you tell it whatever you hit, destroy it. And you test that, you click fire, and the enemy destro is destroyed because the bullet immediately hit the thing it was being fired from. Um, so a layer mask is a way of getting around that. Uh, we don't have any right now, so we can't finish the sentence. Um, the layer mask we want is a, is a, um, it's a layer mask that's just going to filter out everything except walls. And that's going to be a really common thing we want. So I'm going to define it not here, but in references. Because there is, this is just the guard behavior. If I define it here, only guards are going to know about it. Actually, I think everyone wants to know about it. Everyone might need to, to uh, get to it. So I've gone to references. I'm typing public static layer mask. Um, and I'm just going to call it walls layer. Uh, and I've forgotten how to write this. Because <laughs> we actually define it right here. Uh, let me see if I can figure it out. Layer mask dot get mask. Yes, here we go. Um, and then we just put walls in quote marks. So, all right, so layer mask is a variable type. It's this type of thing. It's a, sort of a, like a filter that, for physics um, that's going to tell the physics, any physics thing we, that we um, do with this to ignore everything except a certain kind of layer. Um, and I'll show you what a layer is soon. I think we've used them, we have used them before for bullets. Um, uh, so it's not a new concept for us. Um, and, oh yeah, so that, that it's a variable type. It's also a hotline. You can use it like a hotline. Remember, we do this with vector three, right? We, all the time we're defining vector threes, but we also sometimes call the vector three hotline and say, hey, wh what is up? What is um, uh, zero and things like that. Uh, so we call the layer mask hotline and we say, hey, can you get me a layer mask that is just walls? Uh, you can actually also pass in other things. You could do walls and enemies like this. Um, and that will create a layer mask that, where it includes both of those layers. Uh, we only want one layer at the moment. Um, so it's just going to be walls. But that word walls, I just made that up. That's just arbitrary. That isn't set anywhere in Unity yet. So we're going to go back to Unity and pick any old obstacle. It doesn't matter what at the moment. Um, or wall. Uh, uh, our obstacles are walls as well, in a sense. Uh, any of these, and then there's a little thing called layer here. Uh, yeah, previously we created a bullet layer. Uh, now we're going to go to add layer, and we're going to write in walls. And I will have ranted about this at the time. <laughs> um, 
because it's a thing that eternally annoys me. I, like I just so told you I want to set the layer and then I typed in a new layer, but that hasn't set it. It's still on default, so you've got to go back and set it. Uh, so actually, before we set it, rather than doing it individually to every single thing, we can shift, click, and select all of our things down here, and then I'm going to hold control and click everything that says wall in it. Um, are there any other obstacles? No, I guess four walls and three obstacles is all we've got. I've got all of them selected, and then all at once I can click on layer here and go to walls, and now they're all on the walls layer. Um, yeah, and that's more or less it. And just the fact that I wrote the word walls there and I've written the word walls here means that these two things will be connected. They will, um, uh, the references variable will refer to that layer. Uh, and so, back in our raycast, we can finish this by typing references dot um, walls layer. And that should be a valid line of code after which we do some brackets. Uh, what have I forgotten? Why is it complaining? It needs another close bracket, does it? Oh yeah, for the if, I see. Um, okay, so all of that says if we hit a wall. This whole thing, I'll, um, I'll do a, a nice long comment to explain everything we just did. Um, let's just write out the basically the same call and I'll just explain it. Starting point, comma, Direction, comma, distance to check, comma, layer mask that um, only includes things we care about hitting. Um, and then this returns true if we hit uh, something on that layer when we shoot a laser in that direction for that distance. That's got long, so I'm going to put down a separate line. So, all of which means uh, there's a mistake here because uh, I just said it returns true if we do hit a wall. Well, all of this is checking have we seen the player? If we did hit a wall between us and the player, um, then we didn't see the player. So, actually, we want to add equals false here. So that says, if shooting a laser from our eyes to the player didn't hit a wall, then yeah, we did see him. And so all of this stuff that was to do with seeing him, we're going to put that inside this if statement. That all makes sense, right? So first we check, are they in vision range? Then we check, are they in our vision angle? And then only if all that's true, do we actually try shooting a laser at them. And if that laser hits a wall before it hits them, then we didn't see them. Um, and so we check. Oh, well, as long as that laser didn't hit a wall, as long as that is false, then we should be alerted. And that ought to fix it. All right, and here's our test case. Yeah, look at that, didn't see me, did he? Just let it go around again, just to check. And now if I go in front of the wall, perfect. Exactly what I wanted. Um, so yeah, I said uh, there's another problem with our detection code, which is that, um, uh, not that with the detection code actually, just, just in general, when a weapon fires, we want that to alert all the spawners, uh, or the, there's only one enemy spawner at the moment. So this code that says when, when a guard sees us, we do references.spawner.activated equals true, that is the thing that summons the enemies. I'm just going to copy and paste that, and then we'll go to weapon behavior. Um, uh, just as a reminder, anytime if you don't have that file open, you hit Control T and you start typing weapon behavior and it pops up and then you hit enter and that will jump you to it. Um, weapon behavior uh, has this fire function and it only fires if, if the second since last shot is, is greater than the seconds between shots. But here, if we get this far, then we are firing. Uh, let's do it here. Let's say references.spawner.activated equals true. So it doesn't matter that um, sometimes the spawner will already have been activated, like it might already be true, in fact it, you know, uh, only the first shot will it be false, it will always be true afterwards. We don't need to worry about that, uh, there's no point in checking whether it's false, we just set it to true, it doesn't cost anything to set it to true really, um, not in the grand scheme of things, so we just do that every time we fire. So let's just check that works. Uh, 
guess I need to pick up a weapon undetected to be able to test this. Yeah. So, um, enemies flood in. So, we will get back to ray casts in a second. There's a couple other things that are really bothering me right now. One is, look at this, I'm firing this rifle. I have no idea what is happening. There's like, uh, it, there is technically a gold bullet coming out, but with our new lighting, it's impossible to see. And then the other thing is, these health bars are absolutely swamping me. Um, let's fix the um, the rifle thing first. Now, I don't remember doing this, but it turns out we have two explosion materials. I've This thing, for a long time, I've been thinking this explosion material is really weird. It's very strange that our explosions are gold, <laughs> like shiny gold. Um, uh, we're never going to get them looking good because I'm not an artist, uh, but uh, just something a bit less crazy than that would be nice. Um, so at some point, I created an extra one. If you didn't, in fact, I'm going to, if you already have this this explosion material one, then great. Uh, I'm just going to delete it for now because I want to show you how to create it in case you don't, because I don't think that was part of the lesson because I didn't do anything with it. Uh, so I just click on explosion material and I hit control D and that duplicates it. Um, and now actually I am going to, what am I going to do? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename the old explosion material to just gold material because we do still want that for weapons and stuff. And then this new one, instead of being Explosion Material 1, it's just going to be Explosion Material. I'm pressing F2 there to rename. Um, they've both gone dark. <laughs> Don't worry about that. That's just a Unity bug, I think. It just forgets about lighting levels sometimes. Um, and so Gold Material, that's fine. We leave it as is. It's a weird thing we've created there, but <laughs> it, looks, it does look like gold. Um, and now our Explosion, uh, I am going to go to... I'm going to change the shader we're using. I think we ended up making it look metallic because we didn't know how to make it look not just look kind of like it's been painted. Um, the world of shaders is, is all about that. It's about the, the quality of the material. What does it look like this thing is made of? Um, and I have discovered that particles standard unlit. Unlit is kind of decep deceptive because it sounds like that would be darker, but it's actually brighter because unlit means it doesn't care about lighting. It's just going to light itself. Um, and if I choose that, let's, um, yeah, okay, I've chosen that, uh, but let's actually just open up our explosion prefab. Uh, I'm going to give it a bit of size. Remember, we made it zero size, so it wouldn't pop into existence fully formed. Um, I've just changed the scale there to 111 so we can see it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do that. I just want to illustrate what happens as, as we change this. But what you should do is, now that we've... Um, renamed the gold material to gold. Uh, we've got its explosion material. I'm going to drag explosion material onto this so that it's that. That actually doesn't look bad already. Maybe we should try that. Um, but what I did want to check was... Um, yeah, there's a thing that bothers me here where we've chosen this shader. We've said rendering mode transparent, but it's plainly not, is it? Like we picked When we picked this color, we picked an alpha of all the way down here. Alpha is, is the opposite of transparency, so it's the stronger the alpha, the, the less transparent it is. In fact, look, look at the thing change as I do this. It changes color, but it doesn't get transparent, does it? Um, uh, and I figured out what the answer is here. Instead of transparent, you choose additive, and then it is transparent. Um, and it's not that we necessarily need this to be super transparent. It just, we said we wanted it to be, and it wasn't, so um, let's fix that. Uh, so I, I'm just going to try this, see what that looks like uh, for explosions. This isn't the thing I said I was going to fix, is it? <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, that's a lot better, actually. That's a lot more explosion -y. All right. Um, the reason I did that particular <laughs> fix right now is that uh, this rifle bullet that we can't see Remember, rifles fires a special kind of bullet. Um, uh, one of the problems is that it's using this weird gold material that's kind of dark. So I'm actually going to drag our new explosion material onto this. It's not letting me do that. Oh, yeah. Um, and then let's just see what that looks like quickly. There's sort of a miscellany of, of things we need to do here. OK, so now you can see the bullet, right? You can at least see the bullet. Actually, I can't. OK. so. There is a reason to do those tra explosions transparently, which is when they overlap, they get more intense, which is really cool. Um, that is definitely a much more explosion explosion. 
And then there's one other cool thing we can do with this rifle bullet, um, which is uh, it would be even more noticeable if it had a light on it. Now that we, we're using lighting in a bunch of places, by default, lighting is all real time. So we can just, so I'm in our rifle bullet prefab. I just right click on rifle bullet and I'm going to light and point light. It's going to create one just on top of that. And I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going <laughs> to test the game because I think that is actually a decent um, size. Yeah, so it glows a bit, not much. <laughs> uh, but you certainly see it now, right? And it actually reveals that our bullets behave in a pretty strange way. They kind of bounce in a, in a very odd way that we should... We'll fix that someday, but it's not going to be a thing for today because it's a, uh, it's a whole other topic. Um, and yet, we also miss a lot, right? <laughs> in cases where uh, we should hit. So uh, I'm rattling through these things fairly fast. I hope I'm not skipping over anything that's too complex like creating that light that's not too novel adding materials to stuff we've done that before um i'm having trouble seeing what's going on in the game because our health bars are taking up all this space we could make them smaller but actually i think there's a better thing we can do uh, so i'm going to edit the health bar code uh, i am going to reload it um and what i want to write so our health bar code all it knows, it just gets told to show a fraction. Every every tick, we're always telling our health bar, here's what fraction I want you to show. And almost all of the time, it's one, right? And a common convention in video games is that when something has full health, you don't show the health bar. You only show it if it's injured. Um, and then once the player knows that, they can just assume, okay, seeing a health bar at all means it's injured. If I don't see a health bar, it's full health. Um, so we, we can do something like if the fraction we've been asked to display is less than one, um, then filled part dot enabled equals true. And if it's not, if it's not less than one, i.e. we have full health, then filled part dot enabled, <laughs> I can't type, uh, equals false. Um, but of course, the filled part is just the green bit. There's also a black background. Uh, so we also want to say that should be enabled. Let me just uh, let me just play this and just show you what what we just did in case it wasn't clear. Uh, we should now see that when something is full health, you can't see its green part, <laughs> which is kind of the worst possible outcome um, because now it looks like I have zero health. Uh, so we don't want that. What we want to do is also hide that background. Um, and if we open up our health bar prefab. Um, the filled part here, that's an image component on this little child here, this sub object. Uh, the background is this image component on our main object. So in our health bar script, we have a reference to the filled part. Let's open it up again and create another public image variable. And this one we'll just call background. Um, and we will also set background enabled equals true here. And background enabled equals false. And now back in Unity, we need to establish that reference. We've created the slot for it, but we haven't told it where to get that information. Um, and it's right up there. I don't, can we drag that in there? Oh, we can, totally, cool. Um, you can also, if like normally you'd be dragging an object in there and then it will figure out if there's a component on there that works, um, but we didn't need to do that. So that should just hide all the health bars and it's not too much of a problem with um, these guards. Yeah, look, that feels natural, doesn't it? And then all these guys, I can see them at last. Oh man, the explosions are so much nicer now. <laughs> and glowing bullets are cool. So we have done a bit of feel this episode. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm missing a lot. And I wonder if... Yeah, I'm just going to make this change now because I think it's worth making. Um, I often see that where bullets seems to go through people. I don't know if it's this, but uh, one thing I noticed that's probably silly is that our bullets, we open the bullet prefab, the rigid body, it says use gravity on it, which means our bullets are falling over time. Now, if you're making like a realistic military sim, then bullet drop off is a thing that you care about. We're making kind of an action-y um, game with a lot of um, simplified physics and simulation. We don't actually want our bullets falling down 
uh, I think that if that ever has an effect, it's going to be an unexpected effect. <laughs> if it ever has an impact, you're going to be thinking, what the hell just happened? Um, so I'm just going to uncheck use gravity there. And then our rifle bullet, because that's a separate prefab too, uh, also uncheck use gravity there. Let's just see if that feels different. Mm, no, we still miss unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah, so that might just be to do with like the collider not being big enough. We can make the collider bigger. Um, I don't think I ever see it with the other weapons. I think it's kind of a rifle problem. I guess the user, it's, there's so many bullets going on, you don't really, you can't really tell, right? Oh yeah, uh, we have a little issue here. The uh, oh, let's save this scene while I remember. But didn't I just see something pink? Yeah, that lurid pink color. Um, that almost always means something is missing, like a texture has gone missing. Um, let me figure out what weapon that is. Is that the shotgun? I'm not at all surprised because we did, we messed with materials, didn't we? That it was using. Uh, Let's give them the gold material, right? Each of the cylinders under the shotgun would drag the gold material to it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. Um, that gravity change didn't really help us, I don't think, but <laughs> I think it's the right change to make anyway, because, like I say, if gravity is ever going to change how an outcome, change the outcome of an interaction in our game, it's probably going to be a surprise to the player, I think. If you're playing something like... Um, uh, I don't know, if you're playing like an arcade shooter and, and bullet drop off uh, messes with you, that's going to be a surprise, a nasty surprise. Um, okay, so the other thing I want to do is something else with ray casts, because like I say, they're super useful. Um, and in fact, with weapons, a very common kind of weapon you might want to make in a game is something that hits immediately. Um, not something where you actually model a projectile going through um, space. If you make that projectile go extremely fast, uh, you can get some strange results. Um, it tends to be if you like, like I don't think if you just want to model a bullet, a, a real gun realistically shooting somebody in a game, it doesn't really make sense to model the bullet itself because it's going to be moving so fast that you can um, uh, get some strange results. Uh, in most contexts, you're going to want to have that hit instantly. In our game. We're making kind of a, yeah, like I say, an arcadey game um, where you see bullets travel. Bullets are traveling way slower than they would in real life. Uh, that's fun in some ways, and it's a, a, a common approach in indie games. Um, but I want to teach you the other approach as well. So I think in our context, we're going to call that a railgun, something that hits immediately um, in a world where bullets don't normally move that fast. <laughs> Let's call that a railgun. So to make that, I'm going to duplicate our rifle. I selected it in the hierarchy and hit Control D. Um, let's drag that over here so we can see it. I'll rename it Railgun. Um, to make it look different, I'm going to drag a new material. I'm going to select its cylinder, because that's the bit we're seeing. I'll hit F as well so we can see it better. Um, and then instead of the gold material, I'm going to give it the obstacle material, which is that dark one we made for these walls. Um, it's not a great choice for a pickup, because you want them to be very visible, but uh, it will do for now. And now... The cool thing about our weapons code is that I, when I was messing around with this, I, I did a trial run, and I was thinking, okay, I've got to make a new weapon. I'll make a, a child class of the weapon class, and, and that will you know, create this laser instead of creating a bullet. And then I realized, actually, you don't need to do that. Our weapon system, we've, we've done a good job of making our weapon system only handle things about the weapon. It doesn't really know or care what it fires. It just has a slot for bullet prefab, and you can put anything in there. It's just a, a, an object um, of any kind. It could be firing the player. It could be firing the camera. Um, and that's nice. It's good to code things that way because then when you want to make a, a variant on it, you don't need to mess with that code. We don't need to change our weapon behavior code at all. We're actually just going to slot in a different value here. So uh, instead of a rifle bullet, we'll make a laser. Uh, or, yeah, should we call it a laser? I think so because because rail projectile like technically a rail gun is firing a slug and uh, I think 
it's just about whether the slug is like radioactive or something but in video game terms it's almost always a weapon that hits immediately and it goes through things and that's that's what we're really interested in we want a weapon that, that goes through things because that's going to feel different to other guns um so i'm going to call it a laser uh or i could call it a beam maybe i'll call it a beam yeah uh so i'm going to duplicate the rifle bullet it's not going to have a lot in common with the rifle bullet but it's just a convenient place to start um and yeah, let's call it Railgun Beam. People who are really into sci-fi weapons are going to be mad at me for <laughs> saying a Railgun has a beam, because it doesn't. Um, but uh, let us open that prefab. Um, and we're going to get rid of that light. Just deleted that. Um, we actually don't even want a lot of these things. Um, but let's not worry about what it looks like just yet. Let's worry about what, how it behaves. And for that, I'm going to create, I'll remove this bullet behavior. And then I'll add a component. And I'm going to write a new script. And I guess we'll call it Railgun Beam. And after a while, once we see its title appear there, we can double click it. And so. Is this a completely new thing, or is it a child of the bullet behavior? Remember how our guard is a child of the enemy behavior. Um, because it's it's a kind of enemy. And is a railgun beam a kind of bullet? <laughs> These are the deep, fundamental, philosophical questions you ask yourself as a game developer. Is a railgun beam a kind of bullet? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say we're going to make it a child of the bullet behavior. Partly because I want to show you that, like we, a guard, the guards and the other enemies are very closely related. They have a lot in common. Um, here we're going to make something that's pretty fundamentally different to a bullet, but there's still sometimes some value to making it a child of the bullet class, um, because what is in our bullet class? If I control click here, I'll jump to it. Um, it's got bullet speed, we don't need that. Seconds until destroyed, I think we will need that. I think our beams are going to be in the world for a moment and then disappear. And then damage, we definitely need that. Um, and so we could create our own class with our own versions of those variables. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, and like I say, right now our weapons, our weapon behavior, when it creates the bullet, creates it here, uh, it just creates a game object. And we do some things, we tell it, we point it in the right direction. Right now we give it a name, although that's actually, we don't need to do that, that's just a thing I was doing to illustrate a point. Um, so all we do is point it in the right direction, and that's it. Um, we set its transform forward, basically. Um, so currently, we don't really mess with it. Um, the reason I want Railgun being to be a child of bullet behavior is that, like I said, it's going to have damage. It's going to have a, a duration, how long it's allowed to last in the world before we delete it. Um, and someday it's possible we might want to have the weapon do something to the damage of the bullet. Um, for example, if you had like a weapon degradation system or something and you wanted this thing to like, you know, one kind of weapon gets less accurate as it degrades, another one loses damage as it degrades, then this right here, we're gonna wanna do something like new, bu sorry, uh, new bullet, don't write this, this isn't real. <laughs> new bullet dot get component, excuse me. Uh, bullet behavior and then set its damage to um, uh, we could yeah reduce its damage by 0.5 <laughs> this is not how I'd write it probably but that kind of thing um, if if the railgun beam is not a kind of bullet behavior then we can't do that anymore because we're, we're making an assumption about that a bullet will have a bullet behavior um, and since I don't think there's any problem with it, we should just make it a bullet behavior. Um, so we'll already have a damage value built in um, and a lifetime as well. But what is a, bullet, what is a railgun beam actually gonna do? Um, it's not gonna travel through the world and arrive somewhere. As soon as it's created, it's gonna do a ray cast and that's how we're gonna figure out who we hit. And there's kind of two steps to this. If you think about, you're gonna fire a an instant hitting beam that goes through all the enemies that and hurts them all um, but it doesn't go through walls when it hits a wall it's going to stop um, in order to figure out which enemies did we hit 
let's actually, let me try and make this visual. Um, and open up our scene. Uh, we've got this wall here. Let's move the player. Uh, oh, in fact, yeah, the player can be here. And then let's drag some enemies in. Um, so let's say the player is going to shoot all these enemies. Um, then if we fire a beam, if we fire a ray cast here, what do we want to do? It's not as simple as firing a ray cast that's looking for enemies because it will just hit one and then tell you, um, well, ultimately you want to fire a beam and, and find out uh, all the enemies that that beam hits. Like how, how many did we hit? Who are they? Uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, we wouldn't want that to tell us all of those four, right? We don't want to tell us about the first two. Um, so actually, we first need to fire a beam just to find out where, how far do we go before we hit a wall? Because we don't have that information right off the bat, right? We don't have an, an automatic way of knowing if I shoot a laser from my eyes, how far does the laser travel before it hits the wall? Um, so basically, step one is going to be shoot a laser out here, um, figure out where we hit a wall. Then with that distance, let's shoot another laser, this time looking for enemies, but only go that far. Don't go beyond the wall. Um, and then tell us about all the enemies we hit. So step one, fire a laser um, to see how far we can go before we hit a wall. And that's going to be real similar to our guard behavior code here, right? Um, I'm going to copy this entire thing, paste it here. Um, and it's gonna have a bunch of errors. So we still do want to start from our transform position. Uh, vector to player is no longer the direction we wanna go. In fact, let's copy and paste the, we had a guide here, didn't we? This comment guides us. Uh, so the first thing is starting point, the next thing is direction. What direction do we wanna go in? We actually just wanna go forwards. Transform dot forwards. The direction we're facing. Remember all our weapon has done is pointed us in the right direction. We as a beam, we're not going to shoot off in that direction, but we are facing the right direction, so we're going to fire the beam in that direction. How far do we want to go? We want to go a long distance, a thousand, because <laughs> um, this is we're looking for walls, and so the question you're asking yourself is how far. Uh, if we don't hit a wall, how far should we keep going before we just give up checking? Um, and so if if we have a missing wall on our level and we just shoot up into infinity, uh, we don't want to go infinitely far because that then our game would never would hang it would get lock up because it would just the maths would be going on forever <laughs> um uh but at the same time we don't want to like probably our level is no bigger than 10 right now but if we put 10 there and then we make a bigger level then that's uh, that becomes uh, a problem um uh it's always worrying to write these are called magic numbers when you just write a number in your code like if you write one that's fine if you write zero that's fine those are fundamental numbers that you use uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, when you're just typing in a, something like a thousand or three hundred or sixty four or something, programmers frown upon that um, because, uh, well, there's many reasons, but one that I agree with is now when I look at this code, it's not clear to me what that is. What, what is that doing there? Uh, a thousand. There's just, what does that mean? Uh, not even why did you pick a thousand or why do you think a thousand is as far as we ever need to go? But just what even is that? <laughs> Which variable is that? Um, so I am going to, back in our references class, let's just make it a global thing. Because if, if our claim is that a level will never be bigger than a thousand units, then we will want to refer to that later. That will come up a bunch of times. We have this in Tactical Breach Wizards, there's a concept of what is the biggest distance that can be in a level. And that is a constant that many different things need to refer to. And so we make it uh, public and static um, and it's a float which is just a big number um, max distance in a level equals 1000 so we're still writing in a magic number but we're only writing it as one place and we're giving it a name and then when we refer to it um, it's clearer what we're doing uh, where were we railgun beam so now instead of a thousand I'm going to write references dot max distance in a level uh, walls layer that's still correct isn't it we do want to check against walls uh, but now, now just asking, did we hit anything? Um, that's not the information we need. We're firing this laser as far as it will go. Um, and 
just knowing that we did hit a wall is no good to us. We need to know how far we went before we hit the wall. This is the issue, right? We want to know this distance. Um, right now, if we just say, Ray, if Raycast hit wall, then it will say, yeah, it did. <laughs> You're like, uh, okay, <laughs> let me rephrase. How far did you have to go before you hit a wall? Uh, and there is a way of doing that. Um, and it, remember when I showed you there was 16 different versions of this function um, that you can call it 16 different ways? Well, we are going to use a different one. And uh, don't write this until I actually check that I'm guessing correctly. I'm going to write Raycast hit, hit info, uh, and in fact, out Raycast hit, hit info. Okay, that worked. Um, okay, so this is after position, the origin of the, the ray, after the direction, uh, we insert a new parameter, a new argument that we're passing into this function, um, and it's a very special one. This, I don't think we've ever done this before, and it's quite rare to do it, but it's, it's extremely useful, and like I say, raycasts come up a lot, and you always need this, usually. <laughs> always usually need this. Um, and I will edit our comment to uh, clarify what this is. Uh, define a new variable to store info about what happened when the ray hit something and then the rest of the variables are the, what they were before distance to check um, distance to travel let's call that um, and layer mask so uh, yeah in the middle of calling this function we actually declared a new variable you might recognize this format where we, we declare a type. A raycast hit is a type of variable that just stores, oh, in fact, when you mouse over it, it tells you. Structure used to get information back from a raycast. Structure just means type of variable. Um, and because the, we're doing this very strange thing of like in the middle of, of calling the raycast hotline, we're saying like, hey, here's the ray we want you to check. And when you have the info, can you send that to me? Can you just send that to me and in an envelope and label it hit info. Um, and that's why we need the word out because we're saying we actually want to get something out of this beyond, I think this will still return true or false uh, like it did before. Uh, so we could do this if statement, um, but uh, I don't think we need to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think we need to just, just to, like demonstrate that out does something special. Uh, I'm going to remove the if, uh, so we're just running this line. Like I say, it will return true or false, but we don't need the true or false. Uh, we need the hit info. And now I'm going to I'll declare a new float for um, distance to wall, and that is going to equal hit info dot distance. So uh, this is this is what we were after. We wanted to know how far do we go before we hit a wall. In fact. Yeah, that's what we say right here. Um, and so I'm storing that in a variable called distance to wall. How do we get it? Well, it's that hit info thing we asked for. When we called the raycast, sorry, when we called the physics hot hotline and asked it to do a raycast, we said, and tell, just figure out everything about where this raycast hits and send that to me in an envelope. And we're going to get like, you know, a dossier on everything about how this raycast hits something. And <laughs> we're going to get. We're gonna get a barycentric coordinate. <laughs> I don't know what that is. We don't need that. We're gonna get the collider it hit. We're gonna get the distance we have to travel before we hit it. We're gonna get a light map coordinate. Don't know what that is. We're gonna hit normal, which is something. We're gonna get a normal, which is something to do with how it, the angle at which it hits something. Um, point will be the position in, in space that it hit. Uh, the rigid body, the texture coordinate, all this information. All we need, need right now is just the distance. Uh, but obviously, when we want to damage enemies, that's the kind of thing we want to get back, right? Um, actually, we're not going to use quite that same method, but uh, still. <laughs> so that was step one. And now step two is for a new laser, only going that far, but checking for enemies this time. Uh, and I think we're going to not do step two just yet, because first I want to show you that step one works. Um, and how am I going to show this laser at all? Uh, that's a good question. Open up Railgun Beam. Um, and I am just going to, we don't want it to be a physical thing, right? It's not going to be an object that flies through the air. So I'm going to remove that box collider. I'm going to remove that rigid body. 
I'm going to remove the mesh renderer. That's what, what we're seeing there. I'm not really sure what a mesh filter is, but I'm going to remove it. <laughs> uh, all we want is just transform and railgun beam. That's the only things. Um, and, but I'm going to add a new thing called a line renderer. A line renderer is for rendering lines. Rendering just means drawing, just showing. Um, and uh, we are going to uh, show a line. Um, it's created a weird pink square, which is not at all what we had in mind. Uh, but this is actually a line, and I want to show you how that works. Um, so a line renderer has got all this information about the line. There's this positions thing. This is actually a drop-down list. They, they hide it pretty well, but it is there. Um, and it's a list of positions. That each one is a vector, so it's got three coordinates. Um, and right now, it's going from 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 1. If we increase that to 10, now you can see it's a line, right? It's just a very thick line. Um, and let's, in order to get a better handle on what we've got here, let's put it in the scene. So let's get out of this prefab. Um, and I'm going to drag it from the project folder into the world. Um, yeah, so there's a slightly weird thing where it's coordinates. The beam is happening at 0, uh, zero, zero. Uh, get those things up again. Yeah, it's happening at 0, 0, 0 to 0, 0, 10, uh, not where we put the object. The, these are absolute coordinates. They're not relative to where the thing is. That doesn't matter, because we're not going to set this manually in the inspector. We're going to do this in code uh, when we fire the beam. Uh, but just to illustrate it, where is our player right now? Um, let's simplify this so that they're at Z minus 10. Uh, OK, or minus 12. Um, in our railgun beam, you don't need to do this, but I'm just doing this to illustrate something. Um, this is going to be, uh, is that right? Yeah. Okay, we're, this is what it's going to look like when we fire it. And the reason I wanted to set this up is, is so that we can see that it, like why it looked wrong. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we, we need this to be 0.5. Again, we, we're not going to need these values. Um, we're not going to type anything in like this. Uh, I just want to show basically what a line renderer is. Um, uh, right, and it looks bright pink. I just told you that bright pink usually means something's missing. Let's create a new material for this. So right click in project, create a material. Then uh, let's assign it right away. Oh no, let's call it um, beam material. And now go back to our railgun prefab and, uh, oh yeah, uh, to assign a material to a line renderer, it's this little drop down list here, because you can have more than one material in it. We don't need that, but let's just drag that in here. Uh, ooh, that looks weird, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like a shiny white beam now. Um, that's why I wanted to drag it in now, so that when we edit, going back to this beam material, when we edit this, we can see how it changes. So. We're going to go back to particles unlit, same thing we did for explosions. Now it's a nice bright thing. Um, and rendering mode, I want it to be additive again. Um, and then I guess maybe we leave that as is. If I change this, does that actually work? Oh yeah, it does. Um, let me just see, because uh, there's another way of setting the color. And it's better if we can do it that way. Uh, Railgun beam. Um, okay, so it's a bit thick, isn't it? We can here's the width thing. We can just drag this line down, make it a bit more reasonable. Um, can I edit this while looking at it in that view? I think I can. Yeah, if you single click it, you can edit this the prefab while you're looking at the game view. And it has no effect. <laughs> okay, I take it back. Double click on Railgun beam. We'll do it here. Um, what I was mainly interested in is, okay, the color, we probably want it to be like red or something, or I don't know, it could be whatever, but when we click on color, it's a special color editor. Um, and uh, if I just click here and make that red, okay, this does work, that's what I wanted to check. So yeah, w we leave the material white and we can set the color here. The reason that's kind of cool is we can do stuff like we could have it go from um, 
this this gradient thing is a bit weird. Um, I'll just show you how I'm going to do my specific way of doing it. Uh, this end is is the start of the beam, and this end is the end of the beam, and you can change either color, and it will blend between them. So we could do like a fade from red to blue. Uh, but the important thing from my perspective is this top ones. These are for the alpha, um, and so we can set the initial alpha to zero, um, and that way the start of the beam is not very obvious. That's going to be good because if you're moving around and firing these beams, the start point is going to be this weird anomaly. It's going to look strange if it's um, uh, if it's not transparent. This is a purely cosmetic thing. You don't need to do this, actually. Um, I just like the way it looks. Uh, but I don't really like that blue. I'm going to change that to red. So we've got a thing that is red at the end and um, transparent at the start. Uh, now can I see it in the scene? Yeah, okay, that looks cool. Um, okay, all of which is just to have some way of seeing this beam in, in action. Um, and in order to access it, we're going to have to have a public, this is back in our railgun beam, um, line renderer my beam. And then to set its positions, we now, uh, I'll make this step three, show the beam. Um, my beam dot positions, no, sorry, set position. My beam dot set position. And we want to set position zero to transform dot position to us. So the, the first position on the, the line is where we are. And then the second position on the line, which is number one, <laughs> because of programmers, um, is going to be transform position plus uh, open brackets transform dot forward times distance to wall. So I open brackets there because I want what I want to do is say we need to know wh wh where does this. Oh wait, no, ignore me. Let's do this a better way. Uh, I bet we can just do hit info dot point. Where did we hit the wall? Just tell us the point where we hit the wall. Um, sorry, not, and we don't need transform dot position plus. This is just starting position is, is where we are. End position is where did we hit the wall? Uh, that's that was in our package of information we got back from the hotline. Uh, so that ought to work. The other thing I was writing was just a way of calculating that from um, from the distance, but there's no reason to do that since we have that information anyway. Uh, I better turn off this railgun beam, I guess the enemies can stay. Oh, hang on, sorry, there's one more thing we need to do. Um, our railgun object in the world, uh, right now it's set to fire a rifle bullet. So let's drag a railgun beam into its bullet slot. And then that should work. Okay, so here's where we put it. Ah, it crashes. <laughs> uh, that's because railgun beam we didn't set the line renderer to anything, did we? We just we created a slot for it, but we didn't make a reference. So I'm going to drag line renderer into that my beam slot. Hey, there it is. <laughs> that looks kind of cool. And walls do stop it. And it's pretty clear what you're doing. You're making a disco. Oh, I picked up the rifle back. Uh, and it doesn't hurt anybody yet. <laughs> uh, but it does kind of feel good. Um, okay, so last thing we need to do is actually hit the enemies, uh, which is going to be uh, another raycast. Uh, this time, what's the difference? This time we don't want to go... Oh, uh, I'm just going to write a different variable name just so it stops complaining about that. Because uh, we, we don't want to define the same variable twice. Um, so one of the differences is that instead of going to the max distance and level, we only want to go to distance to wall. So remember, that's the whole principle, is, is that we are um, uh, back to our scene. We first find out how far is it to the wall, and then our next beam is only going to go that far. Because um, by default, the, the ray is not going to stop when it hits things necessarily. It's going to go through them. And then the other thing is, references wall layer? No, that's not what we want anymore. Uh, let's go to uh, 
our references class. Copy and paste this. A new layer for enemies layer. And it's going to be the same thing, but we're going to look for enemies. And what's on the enemies layer? Let's go back to Unity and tell it. Let's tell it that enemy. Double click the enemy prefab. Do this with a prefab, not, not enemies in the scene. Add a new layer. Type in enemies. Go back to it again because it hasn't actually done it. <laughs> Set it there. And then we've got another kind of enemy, haven't we? We've got the guard. Double click that. Layer enemies. And when you do that, it's going to say, oh, uh, actually, this has uh, child objects. Do you want those to be on this layer? And we do, because the child object, that's the cylinder, that's the actual collider thing. And it's the collider that matters when you're looking at layers. Like uh, The thing the Raycast actually hits is the collider. It's not, it's not the game object, exactly, or the rigid body. Um, sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Colliders are the things that get collided with. Um, and now both our enemies are on the enemy layer, so that's all correct. Um, uh, yeah, let me. I'm going to do this in a naive way that isn't going to completely work. <laughs> um, uh, oh, yeah, let me change this reference to references.enemies layer. Uh, and so now we could say if new hit info dot collider is not equal to null. Uh, don't write this because this is going to be wrong and I'm going to show you why it's wrong and then write the, the better code. Um, but yeah, this is just working with what we know. Um, we could look at the collider we hit and if it's not equal to null, then let's do uh, new hit info dot collider. Can we just do get component from there? Yes. Um, get component enemy behavior uh, brackets Uh, is that what we want? No, actually, let's let's look for their health system because that's what we're going to damage, isn't it? Health system um, dot take damage. I'm just going to write five in there. No, we should write the word damage. That's that's. Uh, so this this is going to do a raycast just like we did before, uh, but now we're looking for enemies. We're only going as far as the wall. When we find something, check. Well, check. Did we find something? Did we hit a collider at all? Um, Oh yeah. Uh, well, this is fine because it's just temporary. Um, if we do get a collider, then tell its health system to take some damage. We're making an assumption that it has a health system, um, and uh, that's wrong. <laughs> but we don't care for now because I want to show you what why this isn't the right way to, to do it. Um, and I've got to remember that our rail gun beam we need to set damage because it doesn't have any yet. So let's just set that to ten. So the railgun bring prefab, giving it a damage value. Uh, let me see how that works. Okay, actually it works fine. <laughs> uh, but uh, what it's doing is it's only hitting the first target. Um, and that's fine, you could make a weapon like that. Um, but... <coughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think it's worth fixing this now. Um, so we want to know everything we hit. Um, and there is, this is, what this is actually doing is, is returning the first thing that we hit. Um, and it would also crash if we shot a guard. <laughs> Uh, because we're assuming that what we hit has a health system and guard the collider on a guard doesn't. Um, so uh, this would be I would I would go through and fix this and make this work if we only wanted to hit the first guy, but actually we want to hit everything. So there is a thing called raycast all. No, there isn't. <laughs> yeah, there is. Why did it not complete? Okay, it just didn't like the the. Um, arguments I guess uh, and so raycast all is uh, it's we can use it in roughly the same way we're not going to get a hit info back and we're not going to get a hit info back because uh, there's it's going to hit multiple things and so we it can't give us a single package of information 
Instead, it's going to return, if I mouse over it, it gives us back, so raycast hit is the variable type that the, these packages of information, um, these dossiers on, on everything, on what got hit and all the information about the thing that got hit and where it got hit and all that stuff. That's a raycast hit. Raycast all actually returns a list of those. Uh, those little square brackets, I can't point to it. Oh, I can point to it. Um, those square brackets mean that it's a, it's kind of like a list. It's called an array. Um, we don't need to worry about it too much because we're going to use a sort of fancy uh, way of, we want to go through all the things this returns. This is going to return a list and uh, we could sort of store it as a list and then loop through it. But actually we can just do uh, for each uh, raycast hit um, enemy hit info in then all of that uh, and we'll do basically uh, just replace that with the new variable name enemy hit info yeah okay so that was a little bit complicated but it wasn't too many lines of code <laughs> uh, so what this says is um, what uh, where have we used lists before let me find I want to just relate this back to something we've done before. Oh yeah, this is in uh, weapon behavior. And what did we do with it? Do we ever loop through the list? Maybe we never loop through the list. No, I guess not. Okay, so this is new. Um, uh, I didn't mean to replace that. Okay. Uh, I will I'll write a, a simpler example um, in fact yeah okay uh, let me show you how this would work if we were going to loop through all of our weapons uh, so let's say in our player behavior code um, right now we fire the selected weapon when you click if we wanted to fire all the weapons we could do for each weapon behavior this weapon in weapons uh, and then we could do this weapon dot fire uh, cursor position. Uh, that is code that that would this would fire all our weapons at once uh, so it says for each weapon in our weapon list fire it uh, and this is how you write it you say for each and then the type of variable you want you create a new variable name here this is really declaring a variable but it's a special kind of variable that's going to change each time we loop through the list and uh, so for each weapon in weapons and weapons is the name of our weapon list we want to fire it uh, so I'm just gonna maybe I'll bring that over in a comment just so we have it for reference uh, you don't oh my god that really messed up uh, Okay. <laughs> this is, I just wanted to give a simple example because this one is kind of weird because what we're doing here, so this part is still the same. For each uh, raycast hit, enemy hit info, this is saying um, uh, each individual thing, we're gonna call it an enemy hit info and it's gonna be a, a raycast hit type of thing. Uh, in, and then all of this is the list. I don't know, I was hoping that would be simpler to understand than me defining a new list. Maybe it isn't. <laughs> uh, I guess, let's just show it to you both ways because I could easily do that. Uh, raycast hit list of hit info equals that. Does that work? Yes. Okay, let's do it this way because this is, it's just easy to read. I've made kind of a monster line of code there, haven't I? Um, okay. so. To make it simpler, uh, first we, uh, I was trying to avoid explaining to you what an array is because it's very much like a list and normally you don't need to use them. Um, uh, but in this case, this, this function returns an array of hit infos. So let's store that in a variable. We declare a new array of, hit, of raycast hits called list of hit info. And then we say that equals raycast, uh, physics.raycast all. Um, with all those variables that we used before, including a distance to wall. 
that's going to give us a list of everything we hit and then we're going to loop through that list for each bit of information in that list um, find its collider find a health system and give it some damage um, that line of code is also not perfect but we will get to it this is to be honest we're kind of at the stage of the game where nothing is completely simple and so everything i try and break off as an individual lesson ends up being a bit thorny when i really get into it um but this like i say raycasts are super useful and you'll use them all the time so i'm hoping that it's actually very hard to tell because our enemies explode uh <laughs> and destroy each other um let me uh is there a simple way to fix that could i make um yeah uh there is a simple way to fix that i could just say uh you don't need to do this i'm just going to turn off the death effect for now uh, so that you can see that if i shoot one that shoots one uh but if i shoot a line it should hit a whole bunch of them yeah hits a load of them uh, it is hitting all of them. It might look like we're missing some, but that's just because it's a very thin line. It's an basically an infinitely thin line. And our camera angle, we're quite zoomed out. It's a little bit hard to judge. Um, and we can fix that. Feels pretty good. Um, so I'm afraid there are two more things to fix. I, I'm really determined not to leave this like in this half-finished state because we're always starting episodes catching up with all the things we broke last time. <laughs> Just once I want to actually uh, end on um, finished code. Um, uh, let me show you what the actual problem is. Uh, if I take this laser and I shoot a guard, the game crashes because like I say, we made an assumption here that the collider we hit has a health system on it. Uh, actually, uh, we don't know that. Um, what we should say instead is get component in parent. Uh, because that is... We did this before, didn't we? Let me see. Remind us when we did this before. Uh, it was for picking up a weapon. So when we collide with a bit of a weapon, we don't assume the collider has a weapon behavior on it. We look for a weapon behavior in its parent or, or the collider itself. Either works. Um, and so we'll do that here too. So instead of get component, we just do get component in parent. Um, this is a bit of a monster line, wasn't it? <laughs> I thought I was going to replace it, but now uh, we're actually using it. Let's just, I just want to split this up into something more readable. Um, so we could declare a new health system. Their health system equals uh, that. And then their health, their health system dot take damage. So that makes it a bit more readable, right? We, we First we look for a health system uh, on the collider that that we reached or in their parent and then once we have it we tell it to take damage we could check if it's null but actually um eh, yeah, let's do that because that's good practice if their health system not equal to null then we will uh, tell it to take damage in our case because the only things on the enemy layer all have health systems this will all wait this isn't strictly necessary, but it is good practice. That's, that's why we've got a crash just then instead of it just not damaging the enemy. So. Oh wow, it just deletes them. <laughs> uh, that's good. But it should be... Uh, let's have it only do 5 damage instead of 10. So I open up our railgun beam, five instead of 10 damage. Um, okay, now I'm trying to decide, do we care that it's, it's fiddly to hit them all? I guess we don't, we don't care about that because uh, once I restore that death effect, uh, 
hopefully we don't need to do this because uh, because you didn't remove it in the first place, but I did. Mm, it's still annoying that you miss a lot. You do miss a lot. Okay, we're going to fix this. Sorry. <laughs> I appreciate this is getting long now. Uh, it's just that there's a there's quite a neat way to fix it, which is... So the reason we're missing a lot is it's a ray cast, and a ray is, is infinitely thin with casting a, um, uh, a very, very narrow beam. And intuitively, our beam doesn't look narrow. It looks like it has width. Um, and so we're seeing there's some cases where it looks like it should have hit, and it didn't. Um, but luckily, there's something called... Uh, Sphere cast all. Is he going to let me do that? Uh, sphere cast all, and then all that needs is an extra variable in there, um, which we can say is 0.3f. Uh, so this is just radius. So basically thickness. Um, and in fact, let's call it that. Uh, beam thickness equals 0.3f. Let's just sort of guess at how thick our beam is in world's coordinates, 30 centimeters wide, or actually 60 centimeters wide. Um, and we put that in there. Again, I'm just naming the variable so it's clear what it means in context. So instead of a ray cast, we are going to do a sphere cast, which means basically instead of a single laser pointer, we sort of take, it's like taking a ball and moving it through space and saying, what did this ball hit? Uh, that's why it's called sphere cast. Um, but it probably makes more sense to think of it as like a pipe uh, going through space. And that will be that'll have a bit of thickness to it. Hopefully, that's going to feel a lot better. All good so far. Yeah, when you have like a thick wall of enemies like that, you kind of want a shot through them to hit. Yeah, that feels way better. Okay, cool. God, sorry, that was really long. My practice was really fast. But that was because I wasn't explaining anything. <laughs> and uh, in a bold move, I decided to actually explain what I was doing in this uh, episode. Uh, that is Raycasts. Thank you for sticking with it. Sorry it got long. Um, and uh, next time we'll work on feel, which should, be, uh, should make our game a lot more fun.